16 verses 4 through 6. It's the resurrection of Jesus. Looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled away. Although it was extremely large, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He's not here. Behold, here is the place where he lay. Amen. 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 Okay, when you take your brown book and turn to page 230, it's not Did I leave brown on there? I put brown on there. So which one is it? Green book. Green book. Green book. Green book. Green book. Green book. <laughs>
Look at our uh, prayer list for the last week. Yeah. Well, tell me if there's any from last week that you still want left on there. Which I know Joe wants to be left on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Joe. Wednesday afternoon, anyway. Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> if you make that one, we're good. I'll roll that. <laughs> well, my Tina's having her surgery on Thursday, the 4th. Ooh. At, at sure. NIU. She got it a little early then. Really? Well, they was acting like it'd be three months before they could squeeze her in. And uh, we took her down to see the doctor. Was that Monday? Or that Monday last week? I think it was last Monday. Yeah. Anyway, we took her in. They said, come do your pre preliminary. So in case something opened up. Well, then they called her to come down uh, one day this week. Uh to do all those testing, do all that testing. While she's there, they told her it's going to be done on the fourth. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, as she just that was answered prayer for Tina because she needed it. Yeah, and she needed it so badly to be done. You, uh, Angie, you could take uh, my nephew Rocky Stacy off because he, he uh, well, no, this is not my nephew. This is my. Uh, brother-in-law mm. uh, but he's doing well okay. he's doing well he had a couple of stints put in when oh. he had them done he's doing well okay. 
and then our friend over here on the right hand side, Mike Moore, of course, passed on, so he would take Mike off. He's about six or seven, eight down on the right side. Yeah, two up from that is Kelly. That's he's got cancer. Kelly Cardell. Yeah. Okay. Alini, <coughs> have an unspoken request. Unspoken. Oh, unspoken. They're passing it around again. Oh, and they get in the back end, not again. Oh, the back end, not again. She was how old? 96. She was 96. 96. Ellen Barker. Barker. Oh, is it Ellen? Helen. 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 Yeah. Helen. Barker. Barker. I know she was ready. Well, there used to be Barkers that lived outside of Denham. Uh, they were from Demont. Are they okay? Oh, these yeah. just is different than that far right. away. I didn't know if it might be the same relatives or not. Okay. Yeah, the Bark was, I think Barker is also in uh, <clears throat> Winnemac too. That was no relation. Really? Is there any others? <clears throat> Let us look down our list. I think Brad Rhoda is doing very well. I don't know if he's had all of his uh, chemo treatments for his cancer yet or not. Every now and then his mom will put a little something on our Facebook. I've got to get a hold of my brother and find out how they're doing. And uh, <coughs> I'm, I haven't talked to him there for a little bit because I know he's been uh, busy with helping his wife because she has her problems there too. I know it. I mean, he had to take help take care of her, didn't he? Uh, two of Louis' uh, nieces came to Florida to visit with their dad for a few weeks. <laughs> And the oldest uh, girl first took sick and had to go into the hospital. And uh, she she had so much swelling in her body. They kept her there quite a few days. And then I think they said she had cirrhosis of the liver, but I've never heard anything about the degree of it. Uh -huh. And then just maybe as soon as they got her home to her dad's house, the youngest girl had a uh, about with kidney stones, oh. horrible pain with kidney stones mm -hmm. and infection. So she was in the hospital quite a few days. Well, it come time for him to go home to Washington State, and the and the dad and his oldest daughter went, but the youngest daughter was still in the hospital. But she got to go home this past Thursday. Oh, okay. so they're all back in they're all back in the state of Washington now. Oh, and they'll finish doing their uh, doctoring there. So let's keep uh, Diane, Allen. Shoot up, Kathy, 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 because they said she would probably have to go home and have the stones busted up, but for now, they had taken care of the infection. Kathy, okay. Just let's keep those two uh, ladies in your prayers. Okay. We'll look at our list to see if there's any, any updates. Our arm is doing less. Huh? Ask last how our arm is doing. Oh, Gladys, she wonder how your arm was doing. Oh, it's doing pretty good. Okay. Has anybody heard anything about Brian Regis? I haven't. He's a Brian Regis. He's what it works for, Mr. O'Donnell. No, I haven't. I haven't heard either. Okay. I haven't heard anything in a long time. Well, I know it, it sounded like he'd have a a, a long recovery. I know his his wife. She wanted him to get more rest, you know, and, and kind of, not that she didn't want the people to come and see him, but she wanted, she wanted to make sure he got the rest and, that he needed, you know, so she kind of wanted them to wait before they come to see him. Okay. All right. No others? Let's take these to the Lord in prayer. Brady, oh, if, you, if you could put Allison on there. Okay. Uh, she's going to um, Japan in the morning. 
What's she gonna do, honey? She's going to Japan. She is? Mm -hmm. Visit a friend? No, no. for the military. Oh, oh, for the military. Yeah. Will she be gone very long? A couple weeks. Oh, okay. I forget about her being in the military. Pray for me too, because it's gonna be hard for me. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Honestly. I thought she was in the is she in the reserve? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They call them up a lot. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of hard to see her go. I'm nervous about it. I bet you are. And it'll be fine. Let's take these to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this Easter day. And Lord, we just pray that people will remember what you went through this, this weekend, Lord, from Friday on. And we're just so thankful, Lord, that you did it for us. Thank you. Lord, we want to pray for Joe. We want to pray that everything about his surgery, every little detail will, will just turn out great, Lord. We just put Joe in your hands. Thank you. And we pray for Tina. Tina's could either go an easier type surgery or it could be a longer surgery. They won't know until they get in there. So, Lord, we just put Tina in your hands and ask you to bring her through, Lord. And we have unspoken prayers today, Lord. We just pray for, for that unspoken prayer, Lord, that's been put before you. Thank you. And we pray, Lord, for each one that's not here today. Some of them are away on a, on a vacation, Lord. And we, some are maybe going to church with relatives somewhere else. But, Lord, we just put everybody in your hands this day. And we pray for the Helen Parker family, Lord. Be with her relatives, Lord. Just be with them as they go through the all the things that will happen in the next few days. We just put this all in your hands. And Lord, we pray for Diane and Kathy, two sisters, Lord, that have been ill. Lord, we just, we just pray that uh, uh, you'll watch over them. They have their dad to be by their side. And Kathy has a husband. But Lord, they need you, Lord. They need you. Thank you, Lord. And we pray for Allison going off to Japan for a couple weeks, Lord. And we pray for, for Angie or Angela, Lord. She's worried. Anytime your children are away from home, Lord, you do worry. So put Angela's heart and her mind at rest. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, now we pray for our pastor as he brings the message this Easter day. Let us all listen, Lord, and help us to understand. And help us this day to be about your business. In thy precious name we pray. service so I can I have gotten through it.
celebrate Christmas and the birth and the coming of Christ, but this is what, what it's about. Yes. He was born to die and to come back again. That's what Christmas leads to this, and this is what we've been waiting for. This is it. So without the death, without the resurrection of Jesus, everything else becomes pointless. There's a, We can be good people, we can do good things, but it's the resurrection that brings our salvation, that seals our salvation. Amen. It's via the faith in that he's doing and did what he said he was going to do, and he is who he says he was. We have no other religions that have the claim that we have. That a God came, lived with his people, died, and comes back to live a perfect life, and become a perfect sacrifice for us to pay for our sins and everything that we've done with his blood and this is something we hear but we have to keep this locked in our heads constantly that he died for us and that we are saved because of what he's done we can be forgiven by trusting in all of this and this is for eternity in heaven so trying to cram all of these gospels together and to put together one big story out of this was giving me all kinds of <laughs> all kinds of troubles this week because each one kind of does a little bit like mainly in john john chapter 20 is where it mainly is but i'll hit some of the other gospels just to move the story along and it says early on the first day of the week while it was still dark Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So the Gospels will all pick up different spots in the story. They'll add, each one of them will add different details. So it's almost like taking pictures and laying on top of each other and getting a bigger bigger story so each one gives a little bit different details Matthew will mention there was an earthquake and that the angels appeared before the guards and they fell like dead men so the guards that were there at the tomb they just fainted passed out the angel just scared them so bad so at the time of this she said well they don't when Mary saw them she's like they took taken the Lord and we don't know where, where they've taken him to at this time in history, grave robbing was a huge thing. It was a point to where the government, Caesar, had to put a capital punishment on grave robbing. If you were to break into a grave, you could be killed. But with Jesus, really there wasn't anything to steal. There wasn't time for a ceremony. This was a very hasty burial. They just wanted to get him off of the cross and in to the tomb before the Sabbath had come. So continuing in the verse three, it says, so Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Why that detail had to be put in there. This is John writing this, so he had to tell everybody that he outran Peter. <laughs> I don't know if they had this competition going. It's like, I'm faster than you. So he says he bent over and looked at the strips of linen there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him and arrived, went into the tomb, and he saw the strips of linen lying there. 
So Peter showing his boldness, his personality was bold. He didn't stop. He's just like, boom, straight in. John got up there and he stopped and looking around, seeing what's going on. Peter just flew right by him into the, into the tomb. As well as a burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head, the cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, again, back with a track run, mm -hmm. also went inside. He saw and believed. They did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So the linen was laying there where Jesus was at. This was more of kind of like a deflated tire. It just went down. Not like he got up and started tearing the stuff off and was just kind of throwing it around. It was there. It just kind of went down in the shape of what he would have been and wrapped up. And there was a cloth that was wrapped around his head that was folded nicely and set at the top of the stone. Now, whether or not this has anything to do with anything, there was a Jewish tradition that if you went to somebody's home, if you were invited there, and you felt that you were treated well, with, treated with hospitality, that when you were done eating, you would wipe your mouth and you would wad up your napkin and throw it next to your plate. If you feel that you had been treated poorly or treated without hospitality, you would fold your napkin up nice and neat and lay it next to your plate. So whether or not that napkin, that head napkin that they had on them, it was like they don't also call it a napkin, was folded up nicely and set next to it, if that had anything to do with the way he was treated, don't know. Just a trivial thing I came across while looking this stuff up. So the angel, after this happened, in Luke 24, the angel says, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. So at this point, they're starting, it's starting to click with them a little bit. But from this point, Jesus starts to show himself. He starts appearing to people, to proving his that he is alive and that he has, has risen. And I'm going through this, I came across a pastor, Gary Hamrick, who says that there are over 39 different, at least 39 other different manuscripts other than scripture that document the miracles, the ministry, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, Thomas Arnold of the Modern Historical Department of Oxford, Oxford, England, says that this is the most documented event. And Bruce Westcott, English scholar, says that this is the most variously supported event, being that there are more documents and more different sources of the resurrection and the life of Christ than any other. So, Celsus, a Greek philosopher, after all of this had happened, a man known for hating Christians and Christianity, and with that, in the culture at this time, shortly after Jesus' resurrection, that women, and even before, women didn't have a say in anything. They couldn't speak in court, they couldn't speak for themselves, they had to have a man or, or a male relative with them to do anything. So Celsus, with that, says, why would we take the word of a hysterical woman, saying that a woman wouldn't be able to describe what was going on, and we can't take the word of a woman who can't speak for herself. But all four Gospels have Mary being the first one there. <clears throat> She was there and ran back to get everybody else. So for the perspective of the followers of Christ and us now, it's a better argument for us saying if they were trying to sell us a story, they would have left Mary out altogether. They would have said, oh, Peter and John went to the tomb and they saw this. They wouldn't have used Mary at all. So at this point, they're starting to figure out what's going on. Peter and John leave they, to go back home. Mary stays at the tomb. She's still crying. It's been a rough weekend. So she's still really upset. They don't know where Jesus is at. So she looks into the tomb, and there's two angels there. 
sitting on the stone where Jesus would have been laying. They asked her, why, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? At that point, she'll turn around and face out of the tomb, and then there's Jesus. He's there. But she doesn't recognize him at that point, whether or not, because it said that she got there. It was still dark when she got there, so we don't know what the light situation was or if there's just that information was withheld for her at that time. But Jesus says to her, why are you crying? And going into John verse 15, woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and then she looked to him. Now she recognizes him. And in Aramaic, she yells out, Rabone, which means teacher. Jesus says, do not cling to me, for I have not returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, and she told them, that he had said these things to her. So he said, so when she recognizes him, she, he's gonna get the bear hug. He says, do not cling to me. Some of them will say, do not hold me. Now, when I was younger, I remember the teaching, like she wasn't supposed to touch him because he hadn't been glorified yet. But he's telling her, we got things to do. I'm not leaving yet. I'm gonna be here for a while. You need to go get to tell the other guys that this is what's happening. I haven't returned to my father. I'm not going back yet. So he says, just don't, don't hold on to me. We got, we got things to do. And this is the first time that Jesus will call the other disciples his brothers. This comes up again later in Hebrews, but this is the first time that Jesus says, go tell my brothers I'm returning to my father and to your father. So on the evening of the first day, first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fears, fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So this gives us a little bit of preview for ourselves. Jesus, we see from one of the other Gospels that he ate with them. Mary was able to grab onto him, he's physical, but they were locked up in, a, in the room and he just, boom, he appears. In Philippians 3, it says, he will take our weak and mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. We're gonna have glorified, glorious bodies like him. He just, it's a physical body, it can do everything, but just, way better. So it's everything we got going on, but way better. So that is something to look, to look forward to. Yes, way better. So he's going to be able to move through. He comes in, peace be with you. Again, moving on, he says, peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now this is similar to what he tells them in Matthew with the Great Commission. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So if you take these two passages, put them together, tell people about me. Tell them what you've seen, tell them what you know, tell them what you have heard. So the Father sent me to tell you about heaven, to teach about heaven and what is coming. That's what I'm doing the same thing to you right now. Move, tell people what you saw, what you know. Now when this all happened, Thomas wasn't there. So he's appeared to them all except for Thomas at this point. So they're trying to explain to Thomas, this is what happened. This is what, he just appeared out of nowhere. We saw him, we had eaten with him, we touched him. Thomas's response is, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into the side, I will 
never believe. Another translation says, I will not, or I refuse to believe. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, locked again, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. So you notice he's popping into rooms just randomly and saying, Peace be with you. It's going to scare people doing this. You're going to end up getting punched. So it's, you know, walk up behind them, Peace be with you. And then somebody gets <laughs> get an elbow or something. So come out with a peace be with you first, just up here. But then he says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put your hand and place it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. So not only is he showing him, hey, here's my marks on my hands, check my side. He's repeating to Thomas everything that he's already said when he wasn't there. So Thomas answered him and said, my Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, you have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and believe. That's us. That blessing that we believe and we trust in this without physically seeing him or touching him the way they did. So we have these four gospel accounts. We have the, the disciples of Jesus who documented all this. We have followers of Jesus. We have historians that back up all of these stories. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians says, for what I received, I passed on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, after that to the five hundred brothers at the same time, and most of whom are still living. Although some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and at last of all, he appeared to me also. So we have over 500 people that have seen, physically seen Jesus. And when Paul was writing Corinthians, he says, most of the people that saw him, they're still alive. They can dispute this. They know that he was there. They saw him. And this happened over a period of 40 days. Over 500 people were eyewitnesses to this happening. So we have all this evidence, all these arguments. And you can not you can bring all this up to people, but it's always a willingness to trust, a willingness to believe and the movement of the Holy Spirit on a person's heart. You can't argue somebody into heaven. You can't give them the document and go, aha, I got you, answer that one. That doesn't change anybody's heart. It's a willingness to believe and to trust and let the Holy Spirit move on somebody. To trust in that. So for us, this is our salvation. This is Christ crucified, resurrected, and Christ only. That's what we trust in. Jesus, Christ, resurrection. That's what Paul said we preach. Christ crucified, his resurrection. That is it. You can't have Christ and and this. Well, I have Jesus, but yeah, I, I still do this. But well, we need this too because this helps explain this. Or this does. No. If you add to the gospel or change the gospel anyway, it's not the gospel. And it is worthless, as Paul would say. Crucified, resurrected, and by his blood that we are forgiven. Not adding in, not putting any worldview into this gospel so don't anybody else tells you anything separately from what we've already taught you it's false so even if I come back and say that well remember this you can't change the rules after it's been set there for those who don't know or don't trust it's one of those things that you have to look at the information objectively not slanted like uh, you have to be able to look at it objectively and look at your own life in the same manner. Be able to say, okay, know <clears throat> that we've all sinned and that we are all sinners. And when you bring up there, I, I heard this 
there's a church it's like one of these mega churches that this week they're not going to use the word resurrection and they will not reference the blood of Christ on Easter because it's offensive or it makes people uncomfortable oh that's the point of the gospel the gospel will make you uncomfortable because the gospel is going to say you need a savior because you have sinned and he was beaten killed his blood every, you know the blood of Christ is what gives us our forgiveness it covers our sins and it's supposed to make you uncomfortable it should make all of us uncomfortable whether we're saved or not the recognition of I have sinned but yet is because of his blood that I can be forgiven this is a matter of eternity to trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior to rejoice in the resurrection that's what we do today just that we rejoice remember everything that he's done for us everything we've gone through this each week hitting on a little bit more of the spot but just imagine where you would be like right now what your life would be without Jesus where would you be some might not be alive for one reason or another <clears throat> I've had some situations like how did I live through that yeah. it was because of my driving of course but <laughs> I sh shouldn't have sh shouldn't have been <laughs> But imagine where you would be without him, what your life would be without him. The resurrection brings in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which they would all receive a few, a short time later with Pentecost. Everything is hinged on the resurrection. Back to, back to the garden, the plan, the birth, all the way up to his death, everything our salvation is hinged on the resurrection of Christ that he has come back and that we can rejoice we can have forgiveness and we can have eternity in heaven with him and the Father so Paul John rather, wraps up this chapter and says now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his of the disciples which are not written in this book but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ <laughs> the Son of God and that by believing, you may have life, life in his name. <coughs> Everything comes down to what we're celebrating today, his resurrection. That he is alive, he is risen, and he is with us. And we've received his spirit. Let's pray. Father, help us each day just to remember what you've done for us. Remember that we have our salvation, that we have our forgiveness because of what Jesus has done. That he is alive and that we are forgiven. Help us to move according to that in our daily lives, in our actions, in our thoughts. And we thank you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if there's anybody that doesn't have that relationship with Christ that they would like to come forward at this time, we can also be baptized, baptism. It's cold out there. We'll do it. <laughs> you get a big rush from cold water. So we take our green book and stand and turn to 328. Are you watching the blood?